This is the 2020 iMac. It's been somewhat controversial because it's pretty late in the Intel game and some see it as kind of a stopgap device. The design is the same that we've seen for the past eight years and it's probably not the best time to be spending thousands upon thousands of dollars on a device right before a major transition such as Apple Silicon. However, this is probably the last Mac for the masses that will be available with upgradable components. So today, let's take advantage of that, shall we? Today's video is sponsored by iFixit. They have sent over 64 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and a Core i7-10700K for today's video. iFixit is my go-to source for parts and tools. I'll be using the ProTech Toolkit for the entire repair today, though if you want to work on iMax, I'd also recommend the iMax Service Wedge, both of which are linked in the description below. I also used iFixit's repair guides to learn how to work on iMax, so if you want detailed step-by-step -step instructions, check them out with the link in the description. So today's patient for the Miani upgrade service is but a wee babe compared to the other Macs that we take a look at on this channel. We were working on a 2015 MacBook Pro, we've worked on some 10 and 11 year old Macs, we even unboxed a Mac from 2007, but today we are returning to the modern era with the 2020 iMac that came out just a few weeks ago. The 2020 iMac has been controversial because it's just one last spec bump in the venerable slimline iMac design introduced all the way back in 2012. And as such, people have ripped it for being arguable value. But here's the angle that we are going to argue today. This might be an eight year old design, but if there's one thing that Apple has done without fail over the past eight years, it's systematically exterminate any chance of upgrading individual components on your own. This iMac, this glorious relic from 2012, still has some hope. It has a socketed CPU, and easily upgradable, user-serviceable RAM. That is what I like to see. There are only three Macs that have upgradable processors. This iMac, the iMac Pro, and the Mac Pro. And given that at $1,800, my base model 2020 iMac undercuts both of those by an order of thousands of dollars, this is definitely the most broadly accessible Mac that you can actually upgrade. So let's do it. We're gonna go Core i5 to Core i7, and we're gonna go eight to 64 gigabytes of RAM. So let's stop messing about and let's jump right in. The first step is to cut off the display of the iMac. Yes, cut. Since 2012, all iMac displays are held on purely with adhesive strips, so we'll cut through them with the iFixit opening wheel and some prying picks. This can be a pretty long process, and you want to make sure you support the display so it doesn't fall off when the adhesive is cut. When the adhesive is cut, there will be three internal cables to disconnect, and then we need to remove the spent adhesive from the inside. They peel off pretty easily, and now we can have a look at the guts of the iMac. It's, well, it's very familiar. This disassembly process is nearly identical to any 27 inch iMac since 2012. In fact, here's what the internals of the 2012 iMac looks like overlaid on top of the 2020. The only differences you may notice are the locations of the three display connectors, which have changed a little bit over the years. And of course, the fact that there's a giant hole inside the device now that the hard drive is dead. The first thing we'll remove is the left speaker, which takes some wiggling to free from where it's tucked under the chin. And then it's time to move on to the power supply. Be very careful here. The traces are exposed and you can risk electric shock if you touch the exposed pins. The PSU has two connections, one to the power socket and one to the logic board. They can be very tricky to unplug. This one took me so long to do carefully that I just eventually turned the camera off. So anyway, let's move on. We'll wiggle out the right speaker assembly and then we can get to work disconnecting what is plugged into the logic board. There's the antenna, the headphone jack, this one, and finally, the fan connector. 
On older iMacs, the airport card is actually socketed, but this year for some reason it's part of the logic board, so no replacement is possible. Yay! Next, we'll turn our attention to the fan, which has three simple screws and then it pops out without much fanfare. Do you get it? Fanfare? Okay, I'm sorry. Now it's time to remove the eight screws holding in the logic board. Keep track of where they come from and the different lengths, and watch out for the captive center screw that's quite deep in the machine, so you'll need a thin screwdriver, like my beautiful iFixit model, that fits perfectly. Now we can remove the logic board, or at least we can try to. The darn chin makes this so annoying as the ports get all stuck under the lip, so you have to wiggle it around a lot to get it to come out. And with that done, we have the fully disassembled 2020 iMac. There's not a ton of components here, but this has been a very stressful process. So now it's time to grab some water, maybe fire off a quick tweet about how annoying it was perhaps, and let's get back to work. Turning to the actual logic board, we get my main grievance with this iMac. They removed the upgradable SSD. Why did they do that? This is where it used to be. You can even see the pins the port was soldered to. Why did they remove it? It was probably for T2 chip reasons, but I think it's just because I want more money. Anyway, we'll come back to that later. We'll start by removing the pitiful 8 gigabytes of RAM and then head to the back of the board and unscrew the GPU bracket. Then we can dispose of some legally dubious warranty void stickers and remove the extremely tensioned CPU backplate. This thing is held on with a lot of pressure, so be warned that it will pop off rather abruptly when you remove the screws. Now we can flip the board back over and carefully lift the heatsink assembly straight off. The CPU will be attached to this by its thermal paste, so be gentle and don't, I don't know, throw it away or something. Not that you would, because you'll need to put it back on. Now we can start the reassembly process. Installing the 64 gigabytes of RAM and our Core i7-10700K are easy as cake. And then we can put all of the guts back in the iMac and enjoy the wonderful experience of trying not to electrocute ourselves again when handling the power supply. So when the iMac is reassembled, I always plug the display in and then tape it on so I can test everything. It's a lot easier to go back and double check when you don't have to cut through adhesive tape. With the iMac now working, we can do a quick victory dance and celebrate the fact that we didn't destroy the iMac or electrocute ourselves, and then we can apply the adhesive strips and close the machine up for good. So now that the iMac is upgraded, let's discuss the changes that we made. Now obviously you know I came prepared with some benchmarks, so let's run through them. I ran Cinebench R20 with the Core i5 and it scored an average of 3,414 points over three runs. Comparatively, the i7-10700K blew it out of the water scoring 4969 over the same three run average. That's an improvement of about 31%. Pretty solid. The next thing I tested was a Final Cut Pro render. I rendered a 34 minute 4K clip. With the i5 and eight gigs of RAM, it took 15 minutes and 58 seconds to render. And now it takes just 10 minutes and eight seconds. Next, I ran the Blender BMW CPU benchmark. With the i5, it took three minutes and 58 seconds. Now it takes three minutes and two seconds. On a small project like this that only takes a couple of minutes, it doesn't seem like a huge difference, but it's 37% faster. So if you're scaling it up to renders that could take a couple of hours, this is gonna make a big difference. Now where I did get a slightly surprising result was in the GPU Blender render. 
It took five minutes and 43 seconds before the upgrades. And then afterwards, it took just four minutes and 55 seconds, which is a pretty substantial gain. Now, we didn't even touch the GPU. So why did this happen? Well, I suspect a combination of the better thermal paste that we applied that keeps the temperatures down, as well as the additional RAM led to a lot of those performance gains. And finally, I ran Unigen Valley. As you might expect, the performance gains are not very noticeable. It scored 2197 before the upgrade and 2204 afterwards, so pretty much within the margin of error. So as you might expect, going from six to eight cores and octupling the RAM has led to some very significant performance gains. However, this computer does feel a little bit lopsided now. We still have just 256 gigabytes of non-upgradable storage, as well as the Radeon Pro 5300 with just four gigabytes of VRAM. I'm sure most people would want more than 256 gigabytes in a computer that has now cost over $2,000. In fact, speaking of cost, did we do well? Did we undercut Apple's pricing with this upgrade? Well, the base iMac was $1,800. Then we added a Core i7-10700K for $400 and 64 gigabytes of RAM for $268. So our all-in cost was $2,467. If you paid Apple for the eight core model with 64 gigabytes of RAM, it would run you $3,300. Or if you're not insane, you would buy it and upgrade the RAM yourself for a total of $2,567. Ah, so we only saved about a hundred bucks here. Now, granted, we do have a Core i5-10500 and eight gigabytes of RAM that we can now sell to recoup some of that cost, but I'm not sure if it's worth it. Don't forget, if we went with the eight core model from Apple, we would also get twice the storage and Radeon Pro 5500 XT graphics with eight gigabytes of VRAM. So that would kind of solve the, the two main complaints that I have with, with this lopsided configuration. And also we wouldn't have to disassemble anything and void the warranty to do that. Hmm. All right, so, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this upgrade is totally, completely pointless. If you buy one of the lower spec iMacs, you can give it some extra boost of life in a couple of years when these components aren't as expensive as they are right now. And that brings me to arguably the most important thing to keep in mind. We used the Core i7-10700K because I wanted to get an apples to apples comparison. <laughs> apples to apples, but you don't necessarily have to do that. See, I didn't show you everything that I did while I was tinkering with this iMac for today's video. In fact, you saw me fully disassemble and then fully reassemble this iMac once, but I actually did it twice. Something that's been a little bit confusing for quite a number of years now is which CPUs you can actually use in these iMacs because they've been socketed for a long time, but it's been a little bit unknown as to which ones were compatible. There's been a lot of talk on forums where people seem to think that iMacs are firmware locked to the specific CPUs that Apple uses in their configurations. So to test this, I asked a friend who was building a PC with a Core i7-10700 non-K if I could borrow it. So I disassembled the iMac again and I put the 10700 in to see if it would work and it did. That proves that the iMac is not limited to using the exact CPUs that Apple chooses. There is no limitation on the chipset. It's just like a normal 10th gen motherboard. The only thing that you do have to keep in mind, the only restriction that there is, is on the TDP. Now, I noticed this when I was doing research for this video and I wondered, hmm, I wonder if I could put a 10900K in this thing. Well, the reason that I didn't is that upon doing some digging, it turns out Apple doesn't use a 10900K in the 2020 iMac. Their build to order Core i9 option is a Core i9-10910, which is very fun to say. But more importantly, it's a TDP down configuration that can use 95 watts, which is the same TDP as the 10700K. So it seems like the limitation isn't the chipset, but rather the TDP. Backing up that hypothesis, I did see some forum posts of people who took last year's base model iMac with the Core i5-8500 and put in 
the Core i9-9900K, which is also a 95 watt processor. I think doing a build with the 10700 might be a better idea than doing the 10700K because, well, we can't exactly take advantage of the overclocking functionality on this CPU anyway, and we might as well save 100 bucks and get most of the same performance anyway. It seems like about 4200 versus 4900 in Cinebench on average, so not a ton of difference there. So the general recommendation for this video, I don't necessarily think that it would be a good idea to go out right now and buy a base model iMac with the hopes of upgrading the CPU to save some money. You're not saving enough money to make it worth the effort and the fact that you're probably going to void your warranty in the process. I would just pay for the eight core model. That model I think is pretty well-rounded. If you have your mind set on the Intel iMac, the eight core model is a pretty good package overall, but if you're buying a base model iMac because it's all you can afford right now and you say, okay, maybe in a year or two, I'll upgrade the CPU. Once the warranty's already expired and the processors aren't as expensive, that I think is a scenario that could work. So I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining if nothing else. I'm not sure how many people are gonna go out and undertake this upgrade. I would probably advise that you don't, but at the very least, maybe now you know what to expect so you can put your mind at ease. And speaking of putting your mind at ease, you can go and follow me on Twitter, at Luke Miani, because that'll relax you a lot, and you can you can subscribe so that you can see other videos. This is a bit of a, bit of a loose train of thought here, but I'm just gonna roll with it. You can also put your mind at ease by going and checking out my Twitch channel, because maybe I'll be doing some streaming when you're really stressed, and you'll wanna watch that. Oh gosh, this is kinda going off the rails a little bit here at the end, but anyway, Thank you all for watching, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video.